At the end of the day, it's always a philosophical question, right, of why are we in this universe? And understanding how this universe works is kind of those first steps. My name is Luis Dominguez, and my job is to assemble all the different components for the Psyche spacecraft that is gonna go investigate a metal-rich asteroid. We're gonna go investigate the largest metallic asteroid that's out there. The more we understand that, we think that can give us a lot more insights on what our actual planet is doing. And welcome to High Bay 2 at JPL. This is the Psyche spacecraft. And so this is where we control the Psyche spacecraft. They dictate how things happen on the floor um, in the high bay and make sure that the spacecraft is safe. My team's job is to assemble the flight vehicle. We pull together all the different components that everyone's building, bring it together, make sure it works. We bombard the spacecraft with as many tests as we can to make sure that the flight software is as rugged and the hardware is as rugged as it needs to be to get those requirements accomplished and then throw it on top of a rocket and launch it. It's amazing. I mean, growing up where I grew up, I never thought I would be working on anything like this. Never thought I'd be capable of doing something like this. So that's one of the biggest things that kind of drives me. I, I like to do a lot of outreach and go out and talk to kids, uh, especially from like socioeconomically disenfranchised areas, because I, I get them. And I always tell them, you know, live your life with courage, curiosity, tenacity, and a healthy dose of altruism. Seeing their like eyes shine up, it's just truly awesome. Hi everyone, I'm Raquel Villanueva here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. In just a moment, I'll be joined by Luis Dominguez to answer your questions about Psyche, a first of its kind mission that, after it launches next month, will travel beyond Mars to explore an asteroid made not just of rock and ice, but a significant amount of metal. The video we just watched introduced us to Luis Dominguez, who is now in Florida getting ready for launch. And he's joining us live to answer your questions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Luis. Thanks so much for having me, Raquel. Should be fun. And, yeah, this will be super fun. And if there's an engineering question you'd like to ask Luis, post it in the comments on the stream you're watching or send it using the hashtag Ask NASA. Now, Luis, for those just joining in, can you give us a quick overview of Psyche and your role on the mission? Yeah, absolutely. So Psyche is a mission to go investigate a metal rich asteroid that sits in the uh, asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's about 2.6 astronomical units from the Earth, um, which roughly translates to about 250 million miles. <laughs> which is a, a good distance away. And uh, I am the manager for the assembly test and launch operations team, uh, which is a, a large team composed of several sub teams uh, that involve mechanical, uh, mechanical sub team an electrical sub team and a system sub team, along with uh, quality assurance and, uh, and other folks uh, who help us put the spacecraft together and test it and then launch it. Great. And, you know, with Psyche just a few weeks away from launch, what preparations are being made now and what are you working on specifically at this moment? Right now, we are specifically working with uh, the SpaceX team to get it integrated onto the what's called the payload adapter assembly, um, which is what's used to affix the spacecraft onto the rocket. Uh, once we get it onto that assembly, we'll um, clamshell it together in it and encapsulate it. Um, in the fairings and uh, then work with SpaceX to get it installed onto the rocket after they do a, a quick static fire test, um, which uh, is, is always a lot of fun. It sounds like it. And you mentioned it in the video, the importance of testing the spacecraft. What, spe what specific tests were done for this mission? So uh, the ATLO campaign is always, and that's assembly tests and launch operations, uh, comprised of what I like to say, we build it, shake it, bake it, and then we launch it. So uh, we'll build the spacecraft, take all the different subcomponents from um, all the various vendors and partners that we have, um, start testing the, the spacecraft um, with various tests that we come up with, um, and then put it through an environmental test campaign where we um, will shake it and uh, put it through its dynamic um, test campaign where uh, we simulate being on the rocket um, because that's the most dynamic environment that the spacecraft will will kind of um, have to endure. 
Um, and then we'll put it into a thermal vacuum chamber um, where we'll test um, being in space effectively and simulate being very cold, very hot, and fully pull out all the air and molecules to make sure that uh, that nothing starts outgassing you. You kind of don't think about it, but when you're in a vacuum, things kind of just start falling apart. Um. <laughs> it's so interesting to hear about all the types of tests that are needed to simulate space as well. And yeah, you know, no, it's, we uh, learned... it... Oh, go ahead. No, yeah, it's uh, we'll we'll simulate kind of being super hot, super cold, and then after we're done with that, we'll work on getting it ready for launch, um, kind of doing final preparations and everything, which is uh, basically where we're at today. And you know, we also learned in the video that you like to do a lot of outreach. So, what type of questions do you get most from some of the kids you speak to? <laughs> yeah, I love speaking to kids. They they always have the most kind of off the wall questions that they throw at you. Um, like how far is the moon away from Earth? Uh, uh, what are black holes made out of? And, uh, you know, I always like to kind of throw it around uh, uh, back at them, right? Because, you know, we have folks with PhDs who have no idea uh, really how black holes, uh, what black holes are made out of and, and, you know, the intricacies of that. And so, um, you know, I challenge them to uh, go out there and uh, figure out what black holes are made of, start studying that. And, you know, you could be telling us what black holes are made out of. That's great that you're putting them to the test too. And I feel like kids also really give questions that I think adults, sometimes I know I'm afraid to ask. So I love that aspect about it too. Yeah, absolutely. They're definitely um, generally much more courageous, I would say, and uh, are uh, more curious and don't have that kind of fear of being laughed at or, or uh, that, that adults kind of get. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun time. And, you know, I have a couple more questions for you before we get to our social media questions. Uh, I know you're in a very cool looking room right now. Can you kind of explain where you are and where you'll be for launch? Yeah, so this is our control room, which we call the system test complex, where we um, basically control the spacecraft all the way throughout the launch campaign. Um, we'll do various small tests going forward from here to verify that there's nothing wrong with the spacecraft as we're integrating it with the rocket. Um, and I will be here during the launch with my team as the <laughs> spacecraft anomaly lead, kind of trying to respond to any potential issues that might crop up. Wow. And then I have to know, what are you most excited about when it comes to Psyche? Uh, I'm most excited about the science, of course. You know, it's going to be very interesting to go and investigate um, an asteroid, which we believe is the field core of a planetesimal, right? Uh, something that, um, you know, started forming in the early parts of the, of the solar system, in the early periods of the solar system, and due to tidal forces from Jupiter and Saturn, right, had a, another object collide with it and potentially create this core that we can use to better understand our own core. Um, on this planet and a little bit more about the universe. Well, thank you, Luis. Fantastic answers. Now, I have some questions coming in from social media. And as a reminder, if you have an engineering related question for Luis, you can ask it using the hashtag AskNASA or by writing in the comment box wherever you are watching this broadcast today. So we have a viewer on Instagram who wants to know, what major challenges did you encounter and how did you tackle them when it came to Psyche? You were touched on it a little bit before, but for those tuning in, what would you say? Yeah, well, probably one of the most challenging aspects was building a, uh, a test chamber within our vacuum chamber. Um, we had to basically build an oven within it um, to be able to simulate all the different um, heating, uh, uh, heating all the different sides of the spacecraft in different aspects. Um, and uh, simulating the hot and cold environments in space. Um, and that, that was a, a truly challenging uh, feat, but uh, our mechanical lead, Dave Verdahl, did an amazing job pulling that together. And uh, of course, a lot of other folks helping him out. Absolutely. And inst another viewer on Instagram wants to know what basic materials were used to build the spacecraft? Uh, well, the spacecraft's got a lot of carbon fiber composites, um, a lot of honeycomb materials uh, made out of aluminum. And, um, you know, we use many different types of uh, alloys of metals. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's mostly metals, and you've got a ton of circuits, so a lot of silicon, right, to build these boards um, and uh, pull it all together. Um, copper, <laughs> lots of wires in the spacecraft. <laughs> Wow, that's kind of the first time I've ever heard anyone ask that question. Really interesting answer. And now we have uh, Mark Kenton on Facebook who asks, who figures out the hardware assembly sequence? That is actually part of the ATLO um, kind of early planning. And usually in the proposal phase, which is kind of the early phases of developing a, a project, you come up with a more or less outline of how you're going to build everything, when things are going to come in. Um, and then the metal, right, the rubber hits the road when you get into ATLA, which starts towards the middle of the campaign. And uh, usually you've got to throw that plan a little out the window because things show up at different times. Um, things that you thought were going to show up earlier actually show up more towards the end. And so you have to rejigger everything and uh, <laughs> reschedule everything to make sure that you're properly testing everything as it's coming in. And you're not going to be surprised once you get to the end. So. It's a, it's a challenging uh, feat, but the uh, ATLO team kind of works together to kind of get that all done and, and make sure we, uh, we meet all our requirements and, and everything works properly. Great. And, you know, for those just tuning in, uh, you are the ATLO manager. Can you kind of explain what that stands for and what you do? Yeah. Uh, so assembly test and launch operations is uh, the team that uh, assembles the spacecraft, um, tests it out. In, in all aspects. So, you know, we do functional tests on all the different instruments. For example, our gamma ray neutron spectrometer, um, we actually put a small kind of thermal vacuum chamber around it. And then we'll actually bring a, a, a radioactive source near it to test out um, its uh, detection of gamma rays and neutrons. And uh, <laughs> the, it's funny, you could actually use 10 bananas uh, to, to do that because potassium has enough uh, uh, t 10 bananas provide enough potassium to to excite the, the instrument. Um, but we actually use um, horse salt <laughs> to test it out. And then our magnetometers will install these cans that simulate different magnetic fields and remove the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, you know, I never thought of now Psyche and bananas, but now they're paired in my mind <laughs> after that. Uh, we have another question coming in from Dynamic Space Babe on Instagram who asks, how long does it take to prepare to go inside the clean room? You know, that room we saw at the beginning in your video, like suiting up in what we call the mm -hmm. bunny suits and all of that. Yeah, so suiting up is actually, it, once you get really good at it, you can get it done in about five minutes uh, for Psyche. Um, it, we're only using gloves and uh, a frock, which is embedded with kind of metallic material to remove static, uh, to remove any uh, static electricity that you build up on your body. And you also use a wrist strap to ground yourself to the spacecraft, um, but, uh, and some booties. So the cleanliness requirements weren't nearly as tight um, for, uh, for Psyche as some other projects. Uh, I previously worked on Mars 2020. And in that project, we had to use full bunny suits where we kind of totally covered our heads. Um, you could only see our eyes, right? And, <laughs> and we had full boots um, and, and double blow everything. So um, yeah, that one was a little more challenging. But once you got it down, that was probably about seven, 10 minutes. That's still really impressive. Like I was saying, it feels like you take like five minutes to put on a glove, at least for me. So the fact that you can just get in there and go is really impressive. Yeah, we practice have makes some more questions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have some more questions coming in. How did you reduce the damage of systems on board during launch from vi vibrations? All right. Um, I can read that again if you need oh. me to. No, I, I get where they're going with that. Yeah. Overall, um, okay. we don't want anything damaged uh, during launch due to vibrations. And that's specifically why we put it um, through this dynamic test campaign where we uh, slowly uh, we put the spacecraft on a shaker table and we simulate all the different axes and we slowly increase the vibration level until we get to a little bit over the vibration level that we expect to see for launch. And then um, while we're doing that, we're still testing the spacecraft constantly to make sure it's still working, it's still working. Um, and uh, that's how we ensure that it'll survive a, a rocket launch, which is it's pretty wild. Oh, and then we have another question coming in from Prasad Sakul on YouTube who asks, how are the aspects of spacecraft performance in microgravity 
or zero gravity tested? That is actually quite difficult to test on Earth. And, um, you know, we have a we don't normally test that um, per se on Earth. A lot of the instruments have high heritage and have been kind of developed um, with high heritage um, components, subcomponents in mind. So we know how they'll work in, in microgravity. But one of the things that we have actually do test out is our solar array deployment. Um, our solar arrays, we build this giant fixture um, to offload the weight on the solar arrays as they're being deployed. So we can actually test out that they properly deploy here on Earth. But of course, they're designed to work in space and with no gravity. So if we were to not provide this offload fixture, they would just fall apart. Um, so it kind of depends on the on the instrument. Yeah, and you know we have a lot of great questions coming in still. If you have a question you'd like to ask Luis, use the hashtag AskNASA. And we have one now from Joan Fenchner on YouTube who wants to know, I'd love to know how the heat emissions um, oh, one second. Uh, actually, we have one from Prishnu on YouTube asks, why does humanity need these kinds of missions? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so these missions um, force us to kind of think of different off the wall ways to, to do things. And um, oftentimes in doing these sorts of exploratory missions, we develop technologies and we develop new things that we can use here on Earth. Um, and it just provides us that much more information. Um, in this case, we're going to investigate an asteroid that we think is a failed core of a planet. And that's something that we would never be able to investigate here on Earth. Um, it is almost near impossible to reach the, the core of the Earth, as, uh, even though Hollywood like, would like to make you think it's, uh, it's something that can be done. <laughs> um, but uh, getting down there, the pressures are too extreme. And so being able to investigate um, something, you know, a heavenly body that's in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of our solar system um, is much more doable. And uh, it will give us much more information about how our Earth is made. And we get more information about how it works. Fantastic. And I know you answered this question before, but people are tuning in live as we speak. So Betty on Facebook wants to know, what was the most challenging part of Psyche's development? <laughs> Yeah, like I said, it, it was mostly um, getting that vacuum chamber, that thermal, building an oven within the thermal vacuum chamber um, so that we can do all the different testing and simulate all the different uh, potential um, kind of thermal environments that the spacecraft is going to be in. Um, but it's also difficult figuring out what to test on a spacecraft, right? There are so many, we can think of endless amounts of tests to do and we could test ad infinitum, but we have to get it down to a subset of tests that um, will prove that the spacecraft's gonna work to do what we need it to do. And what we initially proposed, um, it would do in its proposal phase, right? And that's to go investigate this asteroid and see if it was potentially the core of a failed planet, um, which we think is primarily composed of nickel and iron. And I feel like this is kind of a related question. So Bryant Lopez Roman on YouTube asks, what would you want kids to specifically know about Psyche and its mission? And what should kids know that makes this mission so much more different than others? <laughs> I mean, overall, I would say uh, it, it should, kids should want to learn about how the earth works and uh, overall how this universe has come together. Um, it's, a, it's a very kind of big question, um, but in understanding that, um, you know, it uh, makes you think and expand your mind out and, and think of different possibilities. You know, I never never thought I'd be working here at JPL and building um, <laughs> satellites to go investigate asteroids uh, in the middle of the solar system. But uh, here I am and uh, being able to ponder those questions and be willing and courageous enough to ponder those questions. That's that's really what, you know, I would say kids should learn from it. It's a great message. And we also have Don Forstrom on YouTube who asks, how are spacecraft builders using origami for the designs of solar arrays and communication antennas? Yeah, no, origami is an interesting, interesting uh, art form. And uh, yeah, it allows us to pack um, a, a very complex structures into very small shapes um, and make them lighter a lot of times as well. So um, it, size and mass are a big uh, uh, aspect of what we can send into space. And so the tighter we can pack things in, 
um, and the and ensure that they will deploy right also um, mm -hmm. is is important for space. And so our solar arrays, as you can see, were somewhat inspired by origami, but there's some more complex structures out there that we put on telescopes like um, sunshades on the Spitzer Space Telescope, um, which is uh, an incredible kind of deployment uh, uh, action, as well as the James Webb Space Telescope, which was uh, also folded up very nicely to fit within the air and space uh, capsule. Yeah, it's awesome to watch them deploy. That was a really great question. And we have another one coming in from Menno on Facebook who asks, is there gold on the asteroid? <laughs> uh, there is a possibility that there is gold um, along with other metals, um, other various types of metals, not just nickel and iron. Um, and uh, it's <laughs> But uh, we don't know the amount of, of gold that would be on there. Um, it would be much higher than what we normally find on Earth, right? Because uh, the minerals that we find on Earth are kind of um, embedded within a silica rock layer. And so, we, you know, where we go mining, there's typically a very low yield of metal um, for the, the rock ore that we're mining. Whereas here, we believe it's a highly dense, highly metallic asteroid that will have, you know, much more dense uh, levels of different types of metals, but primarily nickel and iron. Great. Right. Thanks, Luis. And then we have a question uh, from Bruce McNich on YouTube who wants to know, will your um, involvement with Psyche end at launch? And if so, after a well-earned vacation, so we want to know your vacation plans <laughs> now, what is the next project you'll be working on? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I typically like to work the launch, kind of the assembly test and launch operations aspect of, uh, of the spacecraft um, process. But um, after we launch it, um, we hand it over to the operations team that kind of gets it the rest of the way there. Um, I mean, after we launch, we've still got about six years of travel um, to get to the, to the um, asteroid. And we'll be using our uh, solar electric propulsion um, to get us there. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but my next project is the um, sample return lander mission, um, which is a, uh, a mission to go and uh, retrieve samples uh, from that Perseverance has been collecting and get them out into orbit um, to get them sent back here to, to Earth so we can study them a, a little more closely. Shifting gears all the way over to Mars now. <laughs> And um, we'll actually we also fly by have... Mars on. Oh, really? Yes, that's right. Yeah, we'll... So you'll to Mars. We'll, we'll do a gravity assist around Mars as part of our trajectory orbit to get to Psyche. Great. And then we have another question coming in from a kid. Uh, Nocabo Shop Metformosi on YouTube asks Hello, JPL. I am a 13 year old kid from Greece and I have a question about the spacecraft. How do you navigate Psyche? <laughs> so we navigate Psyche using um, solar electric propulsion thrusters. Uh, these are Hall effect thrusters that use xenon gas. Um, and what they do is they accelerate the xenon gas up and shoot it out the back of the, out the back of these thrusters. Um, but we also have um, cold gas thrusters that we use for um, minor corrections of the spacecraft's attitude. Um, so we'll use that and also uh, reaction wheels, which are uh, essentially very large um, masses of metal that we spin up to kind of move us in a, in a particular direction and, uh, and get us oriented. But uh, it's primarily the solar electric propulsion that will get us to Psyche and uh, along with the gravity assist from, from Mars um, and our trajectory that we get into as soon as we leave Earth's orbit. Great. And we just have a few more questions left for you, Luis. Arza on Facebook asks, can a materials engineer work on this in the space industry, like construction of these types of spacecraft? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of work right now going into um, 3D printed um, additive manufacturing um, and how we use that in space. Um, there's a lot of questions on how to use additive manufacturing because it gives slightly different properties from what we're um, expecting, you know, through most material processes. But yeah, materials engineers are key to, uh, to, to doing a lot of the work. Um, uh, I worked on the uh, Mars 2020 actuators, and we actually tested out making um, 
uh, shafts out of different types of metal um, to reduce um, kind of uh, magnetic disturbances that we were seeing um, on some of the sensors. And, uh, you know, these are, we used it just to test it out and get an idea of if this is something we could do in the future. Um, because, you know, in doing additive manufacturing and doing these kind of different techniques, um, you don't know what the end result's going to be. So you got to get more testing done to, to really use it in space. All right. I have one last question for you. What was your path like to your current career and what advice do you have for others? Yeah, um, overall, you know, I've, I've had uh, several careers or several jobs. I started as a uh, I've done gardening. I've worked at um, McDonald's, Carl's Jr. <laughs> um, and Taco Bell, kind of you name the fast food place. I probably worked there. Um, but I, I started at JKL as an intern in college, um, working on the curiosity team um, as your uh, on the Atlo team also as an intern. Um, and uh, I studied mechanical engineering. So um, uh, I kind of uh, got put into the electrical engineering team and uh, kind of just moved on from there. Um, I do know mechanical engineering fairly well, but um, now I'm, I primarily focus on testing electronics and testing the uh, the uh, software right that controls all the all the spacecraft. So <laughs> it's uh, it's been a fun ride, uh, and I've been able to uh, to learn a lot from all the different uh, amazing subject matter experts that we have here at JPL. Well, that was a fantastic. Uh, half hour with you, Luis. I loved hearing about your journey and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it was an honor. And I'd like to thank everyone at home for submitting your questions. They were fantastic. So to stay updated on the Psyche mission and its October 5th launch, follow NASA JPL and NASA Solar System on Facebook, X, and Instagram. And to learn more about this unique mission to a metal-rich asteroid, visit nasa.gov slash psyche. Thanks for joining us as we continue to dear mighty things.